As darkness settled in the North Vietnamese countryside on December 18, 1972, the first aircraft in a massive force of 129 B-52 Shredder Fortress heavy bombers approached its target, with its characteristic engine humming in the background. At 7.43 p.m., the Hoa Lok Airfield, located only 15 miles west of the North Vietnamese capital city, was impacted. For the next 12 days, the theory and viability of American high-altitude strategic bombardments would be put to the test once more, aiming for some of the most heavily defended targets in the history of aerial warfare, even to this day. In an attempt to force the North Vietnamese into returning to the negotiating table, Operation Linebacker 2 employed air power to its maximum capabilities, targeting radio stations, railroads, power plants, and airfields. With the 1972 mission, the United States Strategic Air Command assembled the largest heavy bomber strikes ever launched by the service since World War II. The Trouble with Vietnam By December of 1972, after years of American involvement in the Vietnam War, the resilience of the North Vietnamese foe finally exposed the failure of some of the war policies set in motion by President Lyndon B. Johnson and his Secretary of Defense, Robert S. McNamara. In fact, the Hanoi leadership was convinced that peace negotiations with the United States and Paris were needless. According to North Vietnamese leadership, victory was close. However, the long-running negotiations between Henry Kissinger and Le Duc Tho, who represented the Northern Communist government, were on the verge of breaking down. While the American officials hoped the war could be concluded through diplomacy, it had become clear that the enemy was stalling at the negotiating table. On December 14th, Secretary of Defense Henry Kissinger fired an ultimatum, threatening severe consequences should North Vietnam not return to the negotiating table within 72 hours. That same day, President Richard Nixon issued an order of his own to the Joint Chiefs, quote, You are to commence at approximately 1,200 hours Zulu, December 18, 1972, a three-day maximum effort, repeat maximum effort, of B-52 and Tekker strikes in the Hanoi and Haiphong areas. Object is maximum destruction of selected targets. Be prepared to extend operations past three days, if directed. Getting to work. Calling upon the Air Force to save the situation, the service responded with an 11-day bombing campaign, Operation Linebacker 2. The primary objective of the massive bombing operation was to force the North Vietnamese government into entering forceful negotiations for a ceasefire agreement. Unlike previous bombing campaigns, including the initial linebacker, this one provided the Air Force and United States Naval Forces with specific objectives, removing many of the restrictions that had previously caused friction and frustration within the Pentagon. Linebacker 2 would be different, destroying as many major target complexes in the Hanoi and Haiphong areas as possible, using two distinct types of efforts. During planning, Air Force officers carefully curated the list of targets to avoid as much civilian and prison camp collateral damage as possible. The operation called for three days of intensive effort, with a strong prospect of continuous bombing. An all-weather force of heavy B-52 Shadow Fortress bombers and smaller F-111 Aardvark attack aircraft would bomb during the night, while other tactical aircraft would carry out other daytime attacks. The nighttime bombers would approach the city of Hanoi at night in three waves, all performing identical approach pads at the same altitude. Strato Fortress. The flight line at Anderson Air Force Base, Guam, which became the main base used in the operation, was jammed with a whopping 99 B-52Gs and 53 B-52Ds. From there, the mission would run about 12 hours and require in-flight refueling. Meanwhile, Another 54 B-52Ds were available at U Tapau Royal Thai Airfield in Thailand. Much closer to Hanoi, these missions would only take about four hours. Despite being the same model, 
The G and D variants of the Stratofortress bomber had significantly different capabilities. The B-52G variant carried fewer jammers and had less power than the B-52D, but had more efficient engines and larger fuel tanks for longer mission routes. In addition, all the D-variant Stratofortresses were equipped with the latest electronic countermeasure modifications, as opposed to only half the G models. This detail would prove to be a weak point in Linebacker 2, as all unmodified G models turned out to be vulnerable to surface-to-air missiles. Despite the massive force of the B-52s, Linebacker 2 would still be a dangerous mission for the American airmen. At the start of Linebacker 2, the Air Defense Missile Forces of the Vietnamese People's Army were comprised of 36 Air Defense Missile Battalions armed with the S-75M Divina missile system, a plethora of supplies of anti-aircraft artillery, and Russian MiG-21 and MiG-17 jets. Even so, in contrast to the highly trained pilots of the SACS B-52s, about 40% of the North Vietnamese crews were young and inexperienced. Closing in. It took nearly two hours for 87 B-52s from the Anderson-Guam base to taxi, take off, and become airborne on the afternoon of December 18, 1972. The Stratofortresses were joined by 42 more B-52s flying out of Utapau, making up the largest attacking bomber force since World War II. While the North Vietnamese leaders were already expecting a United States air attack, the officials and civilians were all shocked by the intensity and sheer size of the December 18th assault. Reacting as quickly as they could to the American effort, the forces of the North used their surface-to-air missiles effectively, concentrating their efforts on the post-target turn. In a rare recording of the radio communications inside one of the B-52s that survives to this day, one airman can be heard saying, quote, I've never seen so much AAA in my life. At the time, the United States top officials were worried about the deployment of the B-52s, as production had stopped by then, and the loss of an aircraft would be a significant loss for America. Even so, during the busy nights of the operation, the B-52 crews proved that the bomber was still as iconic as it was during the latter phase of World War II. Done for. Between December 18th and 22nd, the Navy conducted more than 100 Linebacker II strikes, concentrating the effort in the Haiphong area. The strikes were targeted against North Vietnamese surface-to-air missiles and anti-aircraft artillery installations, highways and railroads, army barracks, pivotal naval bases, petroleum centers, and other military-related infrastructures. Then, on December 25th, a Christmas Day bombing and tactical air attack recess went into effect. During this time, none of the American air services flew any sorties. Heavy raids in the vicinity of Hanoi resumed the day after the Christmas Day bombing halt, and eased as the North Vietnamese officials began showing signs of willingness to return to the negotiating table. In a matter of days, the impact of the bombing became evident in the severe damage to the North Vietnamese logistic and war support capabilities. By December 29, 1972, the more than 700 nighttime sorties flown by B-52s and the additional 650 daytime strikes finally achieved the operation's objective. The North Vietnamese government, impacted by the massive losses, had no choice but to return to the conference table. Back to the drawing board. During Operation Linebacker 2, B-52s from the Strategic Air Command flew an incredible 729 sorties, dropping 15,000 tons of bombs. Moreover, the Air Force only lost 15 B-52 bombers, or less than 2% of the total loss rate. Out of the 92 B-52 crew members involved in incidents during the so-called 12-Day War, 26 were recovered, 25 were missing in action, 33 became prisoners of war, and eight perished. In addition, the United States lost two F-111As, three F-4s, two A-7s, two A-6s, one EB-66, one HH-53, and one RA-5C. With Linebacker 2, 
the United States proved that massive waves of B-52s, supported by tactical air assets, were an effective method to engage and defeat the enemy. Meanwhile, inside the deplorable prisons where they were being held, the American prisoners of war experienced an unimaginable morale boost upon seeing their once brutal captors frightened and being polite. The full application of air power against North Vietnam as part of the Strategic Air Command's Linebacker II had been a success. According to Major General Thomas Boussier, Commander, 8th Air Force, the operation, quote, restored hope to those locked away in the Hanoi Hilton and unlocked the chains of previous operations, allowing us to do what we were made to do, take the fight to the enemy. While negotiations for peace were in a stalemate, the nation called on the mighty 8th, and we answered in force. North Vietnam eventually accepted that the war was at a stalemate and returned to France for negotiations, signing the Paris Peace Accords on January 27, 1973. Within two months of the day of the signing, nearly 600 American prisoners of war were released and sent back to the United States. Even so, after two years of what Henry Kissinger called a decent interval, the Hanoi leaders knew they no longer faced any realistic threat of another Linebacker 2 like operation and invaded the South across a broad front, entering Saigon on April 30, 1975, and finally unifying the two Vietnams under Hanoi's totalitarian control. Thank you for watching Dark Skies. Click on your screen and check out another of our Dark Documentaries channels, where we delve into the most impressive battles and the most powerful weapons used in them. Also, hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest content, which we publish regularly. Stay tuned.